This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Hi, Mr. Feige. My name's Matt. Everybody calls me Nando. It's a long story. We actually met on an AMA, your Reddit Ask Me Anything. I asked what your favorite scene in the Marvel Cinematic Universe was. It's actually a reference to a series I organized called One Marvelous Scene. Together, hundreds of YouTubers made videos about their favorite scenes in the MCU. It was pretty amazing, and thank you everybody who made a video as part of that project. They are so great. And I'm not going to say that I believe that's partially why Endgame broke all those box office records, but I'm also not willing to write it off just yet. We'll never know. But I'm making this video because of the second half of my AMA question. I asked if you have plans for Ant-Man and the Wasp 2. Is there a script you guys are working on? Because I think it would be crazy to not be working on another movie in that series, considering how great those characters are, especially considering how fun they've been in the team-up movies. And if by chance you don't have a plan yet, I asked if I could submit my own. My pitch for Ant-Man and the Wasp 2. I've been working on it for a while now, I think it would fit pretty nicely into the post-endgame MCU. And while you didn't answer my question about the pitch, you didn't not answer it either. So I'm gonna assume that's Hollywood speak for please pitch this to me. So I read you loud and clear, here's my pitch for Ant-Man and the Wasp 2, although that's not what I'd call it, we'll get to that. So this pitch centers around two scenes that introduce two new characters to the MCU. One classic Marvel character, and one that's been around for like 13 years, but I believe both can be part of a really fun and compelling story. Here's the first scene. So we open on a black screen in the year 2014. And right as we see 2014, we hear the beginning of the song Timber by Kesha. This isn't some random song. I believe this particular song is perfect for the scene for four reasons, which I will explain as we go. First reason, I just like the song. I think it's a lot of fun. And a little advice, it's a great song to get people on the floor to wedding. Way better than some dumb line dance. Trust me, as someone who has been a waiter at hundreds of weddings, Timber is a party starter. Second reason, this scene takes place in 2014, and Timber was a hit during 2014. I think music is a great way to set the scene in a certain time period, but it's always done with movies that take place in the distant past. I very rarely see it done with a movie that takes place in the very recent past. Like, Iron Man 3 used Blue to set the first scene in 1999, and I think that really worked. Timber feels like a very 2014 song, and maybe now people remember 2014, but ideally, people will be watching this movie in 15, 20 years, and Timber will remind people of what 2014 was like. So the song's playing, and a location pops up, Washington, D.C. Then we fade in on the Triskelion, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s headquarters. We zoom in through a window into an office, and we see a desk worker. His desk is a mess, he's on Twitter pretending to work, and he is listening to Timber on his headphones. It's the third reason I like Timber. He's just a normal guy. He's fun, he doesn't take us all that seriously. I'm sure a lot of the audience members will be able to relate to that. Automatically, we like this guy. And I'm imagining this character will be played by someone like Sean William Scott, although I'm not married to any specific casting. And I'm sure if you gave this to Sarah Finn, she would pick the perfect person for it because she is amazing. But I just think he's a good pick for the role. If you aren't familiar, Sean William Scott's most notably Stifler in the American Pie series, but he's also done a ton of great work since then. He starred in Goon, which is a really charming hockey movie. He's also Country Mac in It's Always Sunny, a show that's especially close to my heart. And most importantly, he played opposite Paul. Paul Rudd in Role Models. The two of them have great chemistry, and the dynamic between this character, who we will name later, and Scott Lang is the key to making this movie a success. So this guy is online, wasting time, listening to music, and he looks up from his computer, and he notices that everybody else in the office is listening to something else. He takes off his headphones and he hears over the PA system, Steve Rogers. Steve is making his famous speech about S.H.I.E.L.D. being infested with Hydra, which means this scene takes place on the day S.H.I.E.L.D. fell. We're going to see that moment from from the perspective of an average S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Everyone is freaking out. This guy thinks to himself. He comes up with a plan. The speech ends and the office gets chaotic. Everyone's yelling, pulling guns on one another. And instead of joining in, this guy grabs his phone and his key card and gets out of the office. And then we get this super fun little scene where this guy runs around the hallways of S.H.I.E.L.D. while all of the action from the end of the Winter Soldier is taking place around him. As he starts running, the headphones fall out of his phone and Timber plays through the phone's speakers. And it's going to be the sound 
soundtrack for this scene. And that's the fourth reason I'm so in love with Timber for this scene. The lyrics to the chorus are, It's going down, I'm yelling Timber, you gotta move, you gotta dance. This song is mirroring the action taking place on screen. Shield is going down. Steve is yelling Timber. But, really important, this guy isn't joining the fight. He's gotta move. He's just looking out for himself and trying to get out alive. And behind Timber, we can also play the Winter Soldier score to give this scene a little gravity. And we can take this opportunity to enjoy some of the Winter Soldier action from another point of view. While this guy is running, he looks out the window and sees a helicarrier taking off. Out of another window, he can see the Falcon taking flight. Maybe we also see the helicopter Nick Fury arrives in. And I think it would be a great idea to have a cameo where Sharon Carter runs through a nearby hall, commanding a group of loyal S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. Give this guy another chance to join the fight, but he ignores it. And this guy comes to a room. He enters a code, scans his key card, and a big metal door swooshes open, revealing a huge cache of weapons. Tons of different guns. Even things like Widow's Gauntlets and one of Clint's bows. This is the S.H.I.E.L.D. treasure trove. And this guy looks around in the cache. He's searching for something specific. And then he sees a weapon that is known as Coulson's Surprise. The gun Coulson uses to shoot Loki in the first Avengers movie. He smiles, and he reaches towards the gun, but then he reaches behind it and pulls something else out. Something small, the size of a baseball. Then the guy loosens his tie. And listen, no one would love to give the characters from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. a cameo here more than I would. The problem is, during the fall of S.H.I.E.L.D., none of the main characters are at the Triskelion. Not Coulson and company, not even Bobby and Mac. They are all accounted for somewhere else. It's a shame. However, I think we can add another minor character who may be present during the fall of S.H.I.E.L.D. So then, further back in the hallway, we see Patton Oswalt, who S.H.I.E.L.D. fans will recognize as one of the Koenig brothers. I think there's at least one unaccounted for who we could reasonably assume was at the Triskelion. Koenig notices this guy in the vault and says, Hey you, what are you doing? At that point, the hallway fills with smoke from a nearby explosion, and Koenig can no longer see this guy. Koenig yells again, Put down that weapon, now! We can't see exactly what he's doing, but the guy is scrambling with whatever this weapon is. Koenig gets closer, he pulls a gun on the guy, last warning, opening fire, then we see the guy, still partially obscured by smoke, as he puts a helmet on, closes his eyes, and presses a button. Koenig fires his gun into the room, runs in, and finds, uh, no one. The room is empty. Koenig searches around on the floor, expecting a body, but finds the clothes the guy was wearing next to a small, empty container. Koenig turns over the guy's coat pocket and finds his key card, which he examines and we learn the guy's name, Agent Eric O'Grady. We zoom in on the card, main titles. So this first new character is someone named Eric O'Grady. Ant-Man fans will recognize him as the third Ant-Man. He was introduced in 2006 in his own comic called The Irredeemable Ant-Man. And that's kind of his deal. Eric isn't a great guy. In the comics, he steals an Ant-Man suit and uses it for his own selfish purposes. He has fun. He steals things. He spies on women in the shower. Don't worry, we're not doing that one. He's not going to be a creep. He's just going to be a more carefree Ant-Man than we've seen before. So what's his deal? Well, Eric O'Grady in this movie is a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who worked on a secret project. Unbeknownst to pretty much everyone else, after Hank Pym left S.H.I.E.L.D., S.H.I.E.L.D. started developing their own Ant-Man suit. They used Hank's old schematics and some parts he left over and made their own suit. They call it the Black Ant. And it was supposed to be used for covert missions. Kind of like how Hank and Janet worked for the government in the 80s and Ghost was a spy in the present day. And Eric was the agent who trained to use the Black Ant suit. He worked with this guy, Mitch, and eventually Eric was an excellent Ant-Man. But the heads of S.H.I.E.L.D. never approved his missions. They didn't want to risk Hank Pym knowing that the suit existed, so they kept it for emergencies. Also, this suit can generate Pym particles or something to explain why this one still works, even though he doesn't know how to make Pym particles. I mean, it's Pym particles, and the movies don't even consistently know what they do scene to scene, so who cares? And Eric became disaffected. He trained and trained, but was never able to do anything. So he got bored and started slacking off. And then S.H.I.E.L.D. fell, Eric escaped in the Black Ant suit, and it was pretty much completely forgotten about, since most people don't know it existed, and the people who knew about the suit assumed it was destroyed. But that's where things got difficult for Eric. He couldn't find another job since he didn't have any marketable skills, and no one wanted to hire someone who used to work for the secret Nazis. So he turned to a life of crime. Nothing crazy, stealing food and things like that. Doing what an irresponsible guy would do if they got superpowers. So why Eric? Couple reasons. He is a great foil for Scott at this point in Scott's life. Eric is just like Scott with one key difference. Eric is not 
not responsible because Eric doesn't have a family. He's all on his own and doesn't have that North Star to keep him moving in the right direction that Scott has in Cassie. So Scott has a lesson that he is perfectly positioned to teach Eric about the value of family and being part of a team. Eric is also fun because Eric can facilitate much more interesting action scenes, considering he should be far and away better at being Ant-Man than either Scott or Hope. It's easy to forget, but Scott doesn't have very much Ant-Man experience. He's trained once, he had a fight or two, did the airport fight, then took a big break, did Ant-Man and the Wasp, and then Endgame. He hasn't put in very many hours. Hope seems to be better, and she has practiced, but this has been Eric's job. It would be fun to watch someone who is a true pro at being Ant-Man taking Scott and Hope to school. Also, it would just be fun to lean into the wish fulfillment angle of Ant-Man for a little bit. There was a deleted scene in the first Ant-Man that shows Scott using his Ant-Man powers to cheat a casino. That's awesome. Let's use this moment to explore what someone with these powers would actually do. That's why I love the X-Men movies. They showed characters casually using powers. Maybe irresponsible, but it made them super relatable. And again, he is not spying on Captain Marvel in the shower. This irredeemable Ant-Man isn't going to be that irredeemable. Also, like I said before, the title of this movie would not be Ant-Man and the Wasp 2. It would be the even dumber but kind of funny title, Ant-Man and the Wasp and the Ant-Man. It's one of those titles, like Untitled Deadpool sequel, that I wish studios were brave enough to use because they are funny in their own right. Also, I just think it's weird that the first one is Ant-Man, and then the second one isn't Ant-Man 2, it's Ant-Man and the Wasp, which is a good title for that movie, but then I think it would be weird if we had Ant-Man and the Wasp 2 instead of Ant-Man and the Wasp, and then something added onto that. So that's one character, an antagonist. But Eric is not the bad guy. He's mostly keeping to himself. Let's talk about the film's villain. Here's how we introduce him. So there's this scientist named George Tarleton. Smart guy, bright future. And out of college, he gets a job at an up-and-coming think tank. And at the think tank, George is given a grant to continue a project that he's been working on since college. George's research involves expanding the capability of the human brain. And George is making a lot of progress at the think tank. He has access to some incredible resources, and more importantly, the other scientists are helping George put together the pieces that he was never able to by himself. Eventually, George gets to a point where he's ready to conduct some human trials, and he goes to the head of the think tank to get approval. This guy, Aldrich Killian. Yeah, George works for AIM. You may not remember since its existence was pretty ancillary to the overall plot, but Advanced Idea Mechanics, or AIM, was the scientific collective created by businessman and Iron Man 3 villain Aldrich Killian. In Iron Man 3, Killian founds AIM as a front for his extremist experiments and terrorist organization, but, and this is a little bit of a retcon, AIM does have a front. Killian has created an actual think tank, staffed with actual scientists who have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. George is one of those scientists. So George has a meeting with Killian and Maya Hansen. George creates a hologram of his brain in Killian's office and he steps inside of it. The human brain. I don't want to be a cliche, but the brain is made up of billions of connections. These connections are how we learn, think, process information, create memories. And even though there are billions of connections constantly working together, there are limits to what the brain can achieve. The amount of space in the brain limits the amount of possible connections. George produces a jar of marbles. Think of the brain like a jar, and each connection is one of these marbles. You can keep putting marbles in the jar and eventually it fills up, can't put in any more. That's us right now. Even though it doesn't seem like it, our brains are full. So if you want to fit more marbles into the jar, what do you do? Get a bigger jar? George takes out another larger jar, fills it with more marbles. That would work. Only problem is, we're limited by the size of our heads. So then what else can we do if we want to put more marbles in the jar? You get smaller marbles. Turns out, it doesn't matter how big the particles are. The connections are the same. George takes out a bag of smaller marbles, pours them into the jar. If we can shrink the molecules in the brain, but maintain their ability to create connections, we can expand the possibilities of human intelligence exponentially. We can solve all kinds of problems. World hunger, global warming, it's all on the table. Even the questions so big we don't know to ask them. Anything's possible. Our potential for intelligence becomes limitless. George confidently places the jar on the table. We have developed a process that we believe will allow us to shrink the particles in the human brain. We just need board approval before we can begin human trials. Aldrich gives Maya a positive shoulder shrug look. She makes the same face back. Aldrich escorts George out of the room. Great presentation, George. It's very intriguing 
intriguing. Now give us some time to look it over. Oh, thank you, sir. Once George has left the room, Aldrich asks Maya, well, what do you think? It's interesting. Doesn't exactly seem like what we're after. Of course not. Not the experiment. This. Aldrich turns on the brain mapping chip. Tarleton created a method we can use to map the human brain. It's the missing piece we need to finish Extremis. Maybe the rest of this will come in handy, but this, this is what we've been waiting for. I think we can finally get started on more testing. So George tells the other scientists that the meeting is a success, and then he waits for months. This kind of thing isn't unrealistic in situations like this. Moving forward on that kind of trial takes time. But really, Killian was working on his extremist program and the Mandarin scheme, and eventually Iron Man 3 happens, and Killian is discovered to be behind the bombings and the Mandarin, and he is killed, and all his goons are arrested. And so is the vice president. Like, not to nitpick, not unlike my podcast, mostly nitpicking, please subscribe, but can we pause for a second to appreciate how insane the plot of Iron Man 3 is in context? We don't ever revisit it, but a businessman created a terrorist and hatched a plot that ended up with him stealing the president, and the vice president was in on it. That is some Metal Wolf Chaos level nonsense, and it never comes up. It's insane. Anyway, Killian is exposed, the company is shut down, but the scientists working for the think tank side of things didn't know about any of this stuff, so they go free. And much like Eric O'Grady, companies aren't jumping at the opportunity to hire people whose only other employer was an evil organization, so George has trouble finding work. And George keeps in touch with the rest of the AIM scientists. It turns out they're also having the same problem. No one can actually get a new job. Some are planning to go back to school, but George convinces a few of them to work with him, create a new AIM, one actually focused on science. And George is successful. He starts a new legitimate AIM think tank with the help of a lot of the other former AIM scientists. But George has become a little impatient. He waited so long for his human trials that he doesn't want to wait any longer. George has done the math. He knows this is going to work. So one night, without telling the rest of the scientists, George does what any good comic book movie scientist does and trials the process on himself. This is his life's work, and all George cares about is intelligence. So either this works, and he's a genius, or it fails, and he's an idiot. And in that case, George doesn't see that much to live for. So George goes for it, and the process is a success. Kind of. George does become far more intelligent, but instead of getting smaller marbles, George gets a bigger jar. His head expands to the size of a beanbag chair, and the rest of his body stays relatively the same, which looks very strange. The other scientists discover George the next day. They try to help him figure out a way to cure himself, but George does not want to be cured. He is even closer to succeeding. All he wants is some sort of chair to keep himself mobile so that he can continue his research. And he isn't George anymore. He is above names. But he says the rest of AIM can call him the mental organism designed only for computing, MODOK for short. The AIM scientists make MODOK a special chair, and he begins working. And he is a machine. He can compute faster than any computer. MODOK immediately figures out what went wrong. The particles he created to shrink his brain were unstable. All MODOK needs is a new set of particles, but he can't find any that are stable enough, and he doesn't have enough information to just create them himself. But then he sees the news about Ant-Man at the end of Ant-Man 1, and MODOK gets an idea. He can use pin particles to stabilize his experiments. And MODOK doesn't know where to find Ant-Man, but he is able to easily decode the shield files that were dumped at the end of Winter Soldier, and he figures out that there may be another Ant-Man suit out there somewhere. So yeah, MODOK, one of my very favorite Marvel characters. Never heard of him. It isn't shocking. He's never been in a movie, although he is featured pretty heavily on the various Marvel TV shows and comics and games. He's a big evil floating head obsessed with science. So why MODOK? I think it's pretty simple. First off, he's awesome. Just full stop, MODOK is great. Isn't that right, video essayist and comic book expert Patrick H. Willems? Yes, I couldn't agree more. As one of the internet's leading MODOK enthusiasts, I can confirm that MODOK is rad. Very rad. Thanks, Patrick. Second, the way Eric is a fun foil for Scott, MODOK is a fun foil for Hope and Hank. Hope and Hank are very protective of the PIM particles. They don't want their technology to get into the wrong hands, so they hide it from the world. MODOK is the opposite. He isn't concerned with the ethical implications of technology, he's just interested in science for science's sake. And to be honest, I was never 100% on board with the PIM's philosophy. Yeah, their technology could be dangerous, but there are so many positive applications for PIM particles, and I'm not 100% on Team MODOK. 
Modoc either, but I do think there's something Hope and Hank can learn from this. He can challenge their beliefs in an interesting way. Also, Modoc isn't a mirror villain. He usually arms his chair with lasers and other weapons, so even though one of the antagonists in this movie is another Ant-Man, the main antagonist of the movie would have a different power set. And also, the other AIM scientists can have fun weapons, kind of like how Vulture just has a couple of super weapons lying around his lab, which are shown, but we don't see all that many of them used. These guys are mad scientists. They can have lasers and a freezing gun and whatever you want. It won't just be Team Ant-Man versus Waves of Goons. The other scientists can have personality. Also, this can kind of explain who Sonny's buyer was. I don't think it needs to be super explicit, but I think it can be implied that AIM was originally after the Pym Lab. And I mean, yeah, look at him. I'm sure the people behind these movies could turn MODOK into a straight-up threatening villain, but he's pretty silly. He's a big ugly head in a chair. Sometimes he looks like Elvis. MODOK would be the perfect villain for a comedy like Ant-Man, where the characters can call out how weird he looks and make jokes about it. Also, MODOK can resurrect AIM and make an AIM that is more consistent with its comic counterpart. Traditionally, Advanced Idea Mechanics, or AIM, is one of those recurring Marvel villain groups like Hydra or The Hand. They are a team of scientists who build super weapons and use them to overthrow the government. Kind of the same way in Luke Cage, we see Hammer Tech is responsible for creating those Judas bullets. That is what AIM usually does. And I get what they were going for in Iron Man 3, but I don't think it was really worth it to burn one of the most fun evil organizations in Marvel Comics to do so. But now we have a classic AIM existing in the MCU that can open up all kinds of new possibilities. Even if MODOK isn't in the picture, like let's say he gets arrested at the end of this movie, AIM can get new leadership, create new fun weapons. They'd also be great antagonists for the TV shows. So that's the pitch. Eric O'Grady has been running around for the last 10 or so years in the black ant suit, or as he calls it, the slaying mantis, because he's corny. And one day he slips up, gets on the news, and now everyone is trying to catch him. Team Ant-Man wants Eric to give up the suit and take responsibility, while AIM, led by MODOK, wants to get their hands on the pin particles in the suit to make MODOK even smarter. It's a story about being abandoned and finding a family. A story about the responsibility that comes with a superpower. But mostly, it's a story about MODOK, a big floating head in a chair. So that's the pitch, Mr. Feige. Kevin, I feel like we've gotten close in these last few minutes. I can call you Kevin. I'm very easy to get in touch with, nandovimovies at gmail.com. Let's talk. Also, I have to thank Alexander Duran, who has been working with me on these storyboards. They are amazing. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram. It's a favor to me. Please, the links are in the episode description. It'll take you a minute. And also, if you would like to expand your intelligence without doing any dangerous experiments, I would highly recommend this video's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Founded by John Hendricks, the founder of the Discovery Channel, Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,400 documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. They've got documentaries about everything from space exploration to the human mind to medieval history to squirrels. Now, I know what you're thinking, but trust me, going nuts, Tales from the Squirrel World is so interesting. You learn about flying squirrels, prairie dogs, and there's even a face-off between a squirrel and a cobra. It is wild. And you get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash Nando and use the promo code Nando during the sign-up process. The link is in the episode description. Expand your intelligence with Curiosity Stream. As always, I have to thank everyone that continues to support the channel on Patreon. You guys are the best. If you want to see your name up here, get access to videos early, other cool stuff, throw in literally any amount of money at patreon.com slash nandoviamovies. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. Also, I've said this before, sometimes on Patreon, I'll get a comment and I'll work that into the video. I didn't really have time to add them this time around, but I do want to highlight two comments that I got that I really like. This one's from Kevin. If I could make one small change, I wouldn't show MODOK until the characters in the film meet him. Just have him in the shadows like Dr. Claw. That way we can get the immediate joke from Scott about his appearance and he can give a villain monologue about his backstory. That is great, and that is definitely the best way to do it. And another one that kind of builds off that from Susaga, permission to set up one scene, MODOK's backstory isn't made explicit until he meets the heroes, at which point he tells the entire thing in a very excited and detailed monologue. Once he mentions the 
kidnap the president thing. A scientist apologizes and tries to excuse the monologue, but Scott waves it off as something he's used to. Those comments are great, and I think those would both serve as a great way to introduce MODOK into the film. Again, I have to thank Alexander, who's been working with me on this for a while. I gave Alex the script as a guideline for what to create, but he came up with a lot of the ways the shots were framed on his own. I think the framing of a lot of those shots helped to define the scene, so thank you again so much, Alex. Everybody follow him on Twitter and Instagram. Also, want to give a big thanks to Patrick Willems for co-signing How Great Modoc Is. There's a link to his channel in the video description. Go check it out, subscribe, watch his videos. They're awesome. Also, want to give a quick shout out to William from the Patreon. Originally, I was pronouncing Patton Oswalt's character's name as Koenig when really it's Koenig. He told me and I was able to fix it. Thank you so much, William. Also, in the Nando V Movies merch store, we have this terrific mug as well as the Nando V Movies logo shirt and the Dance Like Justin Hammer shirt that I was wearing earlier in the video. Go and check those out. Link's also in the episode description and buy one if you like shirts or drinking things out of mugs. Last thing for me, as always, follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash nandovmovies. It's where I post about videos and podcasts and share this video with the rest of the world and maybe even the people at Marvel who would be interested in something like this. That's all I got. I'll see you next time.